Water is essential for all life on Earth. It is essential for the biochemical reactions that happen in our bodies, just the same as in plants. But in plants, the interaction with water is, is much more intimate. It's a reactant in the process of photosynthesis. It also is an essential part of the building blocks that make up plant bodies. And so when water becomes limiting in the environment, that prevents plants from filling up their cells, growing, and performing all the functions that they need to. And so we think it's really important to understand not only how plants utilize water within their bodies, but also how they develop mechanisms to find that water in the environment. So we're in October right now, mid-October, and we haven't had rains for quite a few months, almost half a year. And we can see you know, what, how most plants respond to that. In California, the plants are used to a cycle of precipitation and drying. And so what we see here is a landscape filled with different strategies that plants are using to deal with this very dry period. In the case of the grass, you can see that there are lots of different individual roots that are developing from the base of this plant. As a consequence, this plant can only grow when water is, is present at that moment. An oak, on the other hand, has developed a different strategy. They're able to survive by developing a very deep root system that allows them to find pockets of water hidden below ground. So above ground, we can appreciate that this oak tree and these grasses look different, right? Um, and we can see that the, the way they produce their seeds is going to be slightly different, the shape of their leaves is going to be different, and the way that they create their structures is different. And that has been extensively studied, and we have a good, strong theoretical basis for that. But below ground, if I think about the percent of knowledge that we have of the biology that's happening below the surface, only something like one to two percent is understood. And so, to a large extent, it's still a mystery. In many ways, plants represent aliens on our planet. We have an intuitive sense of how organisms with nervous systems operate. They have a brain, they have sensory systems, they perceive their environment, and then they enact a response that is appropriate to that environment. How does an organism do that same thing when it lacks a nervous system, when it lacks a brain? Because plants have to. As humans, we don't understand how plants perceive the world that they live in. How is it that they're able to detect water in their environments in order to meet the challenges of each and every individual season, year after year? We don't know. And so an important part of the research that we do in my lab is to try to understand what these sensing mechanisms are in the past, most of the technology that had existed to explore root systems in soil allowed you to do that in static situations. So you might be able to dig up the root system from soil and wash it out and look at its structure. But at that point, you've essentially killed the plant. You've stopped all development of the root system. Rhizotrons are mechanisms in which you grow plants between two sheets of glass or plastic you're hoping that one of those roots will hit against the glass or the plastic, and then that's the part of the root system that you see. But you really only observe little parts of the root system. And so, in some ways, we're fooling ourselves. 
we're probably missing most of the interesting biology that helps a particular plant live in the environment that it is. So then how do we see the full root system? One of the major inspirations was that kind of childhood fascination when you take a flashlight and you put it, you know, under your hand in a darkened room, you can see through your own, own hand that, that light. And so I thought, well, could we create plants that produce their own light to then reveal the full architecture of the root system? And so we developed a system to do that called Globot. First, we have to grow the plants in the rhizotrons, water it with a luciferin solution that allows the enzyme that we've engineered into the plant to actually produce light. But the amount of light that's being emitted is very weak, and so we have to take 10-minute exposures in order to reveal the root system. The plant is imaged, and then continue that process then with the next rhizotron. As the root system is perceiving this change in water availability, so you can see the drying front going down, we think that these changes in the architecture of the root system are helping the roots dig deeper uh, relative to the well-watered conditions where water is abundant all over the place. And so the root system growth is, is being optimized to take advantage of that broadly available resource. With Globot, one of the responses that we're able to observe in root systems responding to drought is that they grow more vertically oriented. And what this allows them to do is to access that deep water that is still hidden in that rhizotron and avoid that dry soil that's present at the top. As that root is growing through this complex environment, it's perceiving variation in the availability of water and enacting developmental changes that change the structure of that root system. And so you can see here, these cells are changing in their shape and, and they're just firing like mad. If it perceives an air pocket, for example, it will avoid generating branches towards that air pocket, but will activate hair development, which will allow it to bridge those air gaps and contact other surfaces of soil to take up water. So when a root is faced with this need to make a developmental decision, to create certain tissues on one surface versus another, it's able to do that and optimize its structure to take advantage of these very different uh, physical and chemical environments. To me, it, there's a beauty that's hidden in the biology of each and every plant on Earth. One that begs you to ask questions. Is there such a thing as plant intelligence? Can we use terms like decision-making in plants? Well, the way that I like to think about it is human intelligence. Ultimately, what use is it? <laughs> well, it's a survival strategy. It's a way of understanding our environment to make the right choices in order to perpetuate our species. Plants have existed on this planet for over a billion years. They're the oldest living organisms on Earth. They're the largest living organisms on Earth. So if it requires intelligence in order to survive, then yes, they must be very intelligent. But what I think is actually more exciting to think of the possibility that perhaps there are other types of attributes, other ways that an organism can perceive and understand and interpret its environment that is not the same as intelligence, but ultimately has the same outcome. And so what are the lessons from plants that might be useful for thinking about all the different environmental challenges that our society faces? And how might we utilize that understanding for thinking about our long-term survival on this planet? 
roots are explorers. They are seeking out resources in unfamiliar, uncharted territory. But we're just scratching the surface in terms of our knowledge of what is happening behind that veil of soil. And it's going to take generations of scientists to reveal that knowledge.